Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. My name is Jasper Orthuis. I'm the editor of the magazine. And today we're going to discuss the latest issue, which is um, issue 13.3, The Rise of Septimius Severus. Um, just a quick, very, 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 very quick introduction. Um, December 31st, 192 AD, Commodus gets murdered in his bath. He gets immediately succeeded by uh, Pertinax. Pertinax lasts three months, uh, uh, but after um, such a short period of trying to introduce some reforms and um, instill some new discipline, the Praetorian Guard gets sick of him. They kill him, and then they decide it might be fun to see who has the offers the biggest donative um, to become emperor. So, in fact, they auction off the um, the throne of Rome. Uh, and the winner uh, with uh, 25,000 sesterces offered is Didius Julianus. Um, but within two weeks of Didius Julianus coming to power, Septimius Severus, the governor of Pannonia Superior, is marching on Rome. And a couple of weeks later, uh, just because the time, the delay uh, in getting the news probably, the governor of Syria has also had himself proclaimed as emperor. Uh, that's Piscanius Niger. Um, and about six weeks later, Septimius Severus is in Rome. And now it really begins. Julia, Didius Julianus's um, support has fallen away. Um, he gets murdered, and the Senate decides that Septimius Severus should now become emperor. Um, so far, uh, unlike, say, AD 69, there haven't been very many real battles. There have just been um, career politicians who got themselves murdered. Uh, but the party is about to start. And the first, one of the first things he does um, is to disband the Praetorian Guard. Uh, Murray, maybe you can uh, detail that a bit. Well, the interesting thing about the Praetorian Guard at this point is obviously that they are upset with Pertinax, um, who, you know, becomes emperor on the death of um, Commodus. And then, you know, within three months, they, they assassinate Pertinax because of his, uh, you know, disagreeable policies towards them. And then they auction off the empire, which anyone who's seen the battle, the film Gladiator, um, knows that that's happening, but it's in the wrong place, but we, we won't do that. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing there, of course, is that as soon as they succeed in, in putting uh, Didius Julianus in power, they realise that they've kind of, you know, messed up uh, Roman politics. And so they then immediately retire to the barracks and don't participate um, as much so that when... Uh, Septimius Severus declares himself emperor 12 days after the Pertinax assassination and then marches on Rome, they are able to do away with Didius Julianus. And then when Septimius Severus basically disbands the current uh, uh, Praetorian Guard and says, right, now I'm going to replace you with my candidates, there's no great upset or... Um, there's no great ruckus at that, which you would expect. Have, having said that, of course, they've all just been given 25,000 sesterces each. So possibly retirement within 12 days of getting that gift is kind of good. But anyway. Um, uh, also, the, the announcement, I think, is um, um, is carefully prepared by Septimius Severus. They're told to all come to a certain place with uh, with their finery but no arms. And as soon as they leave the Praetorian barracks, uh, his soldiers take it over and sit on the weapons. And uh, when all the, soldiers, the Praetorian guardsmen get to the point where Septimius Severus is going to tell them something, um, his legionaries um, sort of surround the area. So they're not really given very much choice in the in the matter. True, true. But it's, it's an interesting uh, point in that I mean, similar to the rise of Claudius, um, where the, the Praetorian Guard has this incredible political power, and then it kind of doesn't use it again. 
um, and then at the demise of, of Pertinax, they do the same and again sort of retreat from the, the support of the Praetorian Guard. Um, and at various points, the Praetorian Guard has been made up of the Emperor's candidates, you know, the uh, Neronian Praetorian Guard had a lot of German uh, members in it and those sorts of things. Um, so that idea that when Septimius Severus mans the Praetorian Guard with his own candidates, they're probably from the legions that have declared him uh, emperor uh, in, in Upper Pannonia and the Rhine legions, because he's got the support of 16 legions. Um, and the interesting thing about that is, of course, that those legions' loyalty to, to Septimius Severus is unquestioned, which kind of makes the whole civil war period interesting in that sense, um, because, of course, he has to bring in his co-emperor Caesar, um, and that is Clodius Albinus, who uh, has the support of the Gallic, British and Spanish legions. Um, and then that allows Septimius Severus to go off and fight uh, against Niger in, in the east. Um, so, so I think in that regard, it's sort of the loyalty of the legions, once again, is paramount to securing political power. Although Severus, of course, is the interesting one in the sense that he's the first emperor to station uh, legionaries in Italy um, as, a, as a sort of further guarantee of political power, although that's not how it's framed. It's framed as, as a reaction force, I suppose. Um, but it's kind of like, mm, yeah, but they're right down the road from Rome and they can they can react to politics rather than necessarily external military threat. This wholesale change of for the Praetorian Guard being you know, replaced also seemed to be a fairly a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, really, by him. It's, if you go back to the assassination of Pertinax, he, when he feels like he's uh, losing, their, losing control of them, he doesn't call in the Vigiles, who could be an alternative uh, urban force that he could use to counter the Praetorian Guard, but instead tries to use his personal influence over them, which unfortunately doesn't work out. It, it looks like it might for a, for a moment, uh, uh, supposedly, but the actions of one man supposedly turn the favour uh, favor against him and end with his death. So it's, I think, Septimius. Severus coming in and changing the alter, or changing the personnel of the Praetorian Guard wholesale is a, a quick fix here. Mm. He seems to be in, in all his actions doesn't seem to be somebody who does uh, takes any half measures. Um, uh, you know, it's more maybe perhaps later we'll talk about it later about how he takes care of anybody who. Um, yeah, I think I mean I think that's. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, there are decisive actions, even if they're not necessarily the right actions. He certainly follows through on a decision he's made, and he, you know, and, um, and it, it, it may have been, may have been coming for a longer time because that's one thing that you know there's little space to mention in a magazine. But um, as Murray said, there's about twelve days that pass between. Pertinax actually getting murdered and Didius Julianus getting to power and Septimius Severus being proclaimed emperor and starting to march on Rome mm. um, <laughs> over a distance of something. He's, you know, at the time he's somewhere in the area near Vienna, uh, modern Vienna in Austria. Um, so that news has to travel there at ancient speed. Yeah, but and you know what, though? To... I mean, that, that's very doable. I mean, for example, I think Stanford University just published a study when they look at the, the, the number of days it takes for things to transfer through the empire. And I think you can do basically from Rome to North Africa in seven days by the fastest galley. And I know that sure, there's yeah. a, yeah, the, 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 the... I, can, I can see the news getting there. Yeah. But um, but at the same within those 12 days, he gets support from Clodius Albinus. Um, but that's a bit of a stretch considering that he's in Britain and it has to go two two ways. He's got the support of 16 legions, mm. um, you know, all the way along the Danube um, and uh, the legions on the Rhine. Um, he's got the logistics support for the march on Rome's prepared. He's got, you know, the, the legionaries convinced that he should be emperor instead of um, Didius Julianus. I mean, 
if if we presume that all of this is just out of the blue, the news comes, oh, we have a new emperor and we don't like him, let's do something else. That's, I don't know, that's perhaps stretching um, credulity? Well, I don't know. Well, that, that's played devil's advocate. Take it back to the Civil War of, of, of 68, 69. Um, you know, I mean, uh, the Spasians acting basically in a vacuum, um, you know, and yet it, it's amazing how quickly these people garner support isn't it? I mean, I think they just play the game of political cal calculus. Better to maybe wait to see or, or maybe throw a lot in with that guy because the one that, that's either before or in front of us isn't isn't the best bet. That's true. They could, they're, they're certainly possible that they're making a, a calculation based on their personal networks, knowing who of their family and friends is in which position and that they can count on. Yeah. I think, I think, think the thing that makes it awkward in this case is that you've got Septimus Severus as family is North African. So they're, they're, my impression is they're outsiders compared to it's, the others. There's very but, little. But even North Africans are on the rise at this moment. Yeah. And, and there's also. Clodius Albinus is an African himself. Yeah. There's also very little um, anti Septimius Severus because he comes from North Africa. And in fact, the Punic. Uh, you know, the, the, his his mother's side is the Italian aristocracy of long standing. So there's almost like a, a a legitimacy that's brought about through that, despite the fact that that long standing um, Italian family moved to North Africa. Um, he's also so been sponsored in his rise through politics. I mean, there's the the hint that Marcus Aurelius has been had a oh, hand in, or perhaps in terms of raising him up and giving him that you know some of the positions that he's garnered. Over well, there's the a very there's a very interesting connection there that if he's in one of the advocatus fisci roles under Marcus Aurelius, those uh, advocatus, um, when the Marcus Aurelius Lucius Verus um, Parthian War occurs, um, they are they are sort of at the forefront of of talking about what the war, how the war should go, um, and that's really interesting in the sense that one of the reasons for Septimius Severus coming to power is the the plague of 166 in Rome that pretty much wipes out large numbers of Roman candidates and therefore he's able to rise to power because he's one of the few left standing literally. Uh, but that also is interesting in his own campaigns in Parthia. You know, he he not only does he mirror Trajan, he also mirrors Lucius Verus in the Parthian War, the taking of Ctesiphon and things like that. So there's a really interesting connection with Marcus Aurelius there. Um, but it's it's a it's a it's a fascinating one. And there's you know the idea that you can do all of that in twelve days seems like Jasper said that stretch of credulity. Does it does that mean that you go back to the assassination of Commodus and therefore he must have already been talking mm. about it? There, there is, are actually um, two attempts on Pertinax's life in those three months that do not succeed. So right. it it might be uh, perhaps not not a stretch to think that Septimius Severus sort of uh, what is it called? You know, he, he, he gauges the waters. But know, I think clearly there is opposition against Pertinax, and maybe yeah. you know quietly some things are set in motion um, mm. to establish think, support and um, stuff like that. I think so it that might when even, it happens, I think it might even be earlier because the other issue with the the travel and the communication is we're not talking summer we're talking january february march we're talking yeah. midwinter early spring so uh for that two-way communication especially to britain um to occur you're looking at a long uh possible delays which also might make it actually a discussion that was occurring before the assassination of commodus that there was opposition mm -hmm that there was a wide-ranging discussion about what are we going to do about Commodus. That's uh, one of the suggestions that comes out of the fact that you haven't got mass uprisings in the in the provinces after the death of Commodus. All seems to actually be you know nice and relatively smooth, uh, they, moving yeah, into the wall of Pertinax. Yeah, there's writing right. on the wall. They know that they're you know that the plans are in place. So so again, the the sources we have. Uh, Dio Cassius in the SHA, which is notoriously unreliable, but not. I think it just gets tarred with that brush, unfortunately. Um, main that, that probably there are other things happening that those sources don't record. Um, and that's always going to be an issue.
Hmm. That, that I'll agree to. Yeah, I think so. So, you know, to complete the question that um, we started on uh, by um, uh, Abram's question, does this trend from transformation of the Praetorian Guard mark the last period of Italian natives' heavy involvement with the Roman armies? Um, that requires more knowledge of um, the presence of Roman soldiers in Roman armies that we may have at this point. Well, you've got a you've got a big change happening across the empire, but it's not just this, you know, just not Septimius Severus, but throughout this wider period of more uh, Kiwatas status being given to cities around the empire, and so looking at a broader um, range of uh, soldiers coming into the army with citizenship status, being able to become legionaries and whatnot. So you haven't got that reliance necessarily that you've had at the start of the imperial period on the the spanish gallic italian uh, yeah. core of the army as such you are starting to get more diversity in the army certainly it's an excellent question uh because it seems that certainly by the first century the mid first century a.d uh by the time and by the time of the uh, civil war of uh AD 69, that the Praetorian Guard had become something of the, the, the army of Italy. That is, the, the Italians were in the Praetorian Guard and that provincials were in the legions stationed in uh, various uh, parts of the empire outside of uh, outside of Italy. Uh, but whether or not it, it, it ended uh, the involvement of Italian natives in the Roman armies, it's difficult to say. It, it, it certainly appears that Italians lost the, just the command uh, positions of, of uh, Roman legions and Roman armies at some point in the next century, in the third century, uh, during the so-called crisis of the third century, when almost all of those positions were usurped by uh, so-called Illyrian uh, provincials, uh, commanders of uh, Illyrian or Danubian uh, origin. I think it's, it's interesting because it parallels the earlier period where Romans cease to be the the source and it becomes romans then italians and now we're talking italians and provincials so you know i think that um that sort of shift and, and of course by by 211 the entire empire are citizens so um that certainly I think the process that's happening cer certainly the idea of what was a roman expanded further and further apart from originally the city and its uh, immediate hinterlands and then uh, uh, to uh, the rest of Italy and then to the empire uh, in the broadest sense of the term. Uh, when, when Septimius Severus's army marched into Italy, uh, it caused a, a stir among the native Italians because here came uh, provincials dressed in trousers, which is not a native Italian dress at all. That shocked the, uh, the Italians. And uh, the, so it would seem that the legionaries had by then definitely become something that uh, that Italians would have regarded as different and at least, at least somewhat foreign to them. The Italians are probably still reeling off the, the fact that during the Antonine period as well, Italy for a time was actually treated like a, a province and actually you know out, allocated the government like a province and the experiment failed in the end, but it would have been, it would have left a bad taste in the mouth and to have, the, and, a legionary army coming into Italy not that long after, um, again, you know, resurface fears that this is maybe the future of what Italy is going to be treated like in an expanded empire. Hmm. Right. So we can't definitively answer the question. Um, <laughs> it yeah. just requires, you know, it would require a lot more, um, you know, uh, demographic information about the Roman army, uh, the third, fourth, and, and where does it end? Fifth and sixth centuries uh, than we might have right now. Um, but as a body, it does seem that the Praetorian Guard, certainly for the next century, comes from the Balkans and elsewhere. Yeah, well, if, if um, Septimius Severus, to a man, re, re recruits the Praetorian Guard from his loyal legions, then you could you could say, yes, indeed, the, the Praetorian Guard is no longer made up of who they made up of. Um. Murray, you mentioned um, 
already that it didn't seem to have uh, impacted his image, perhaps is a good way to put it, that he was from Africa. And of course, he wasn't, he was the first African emperor, but he was certainly not the first emperor not, to not have been Italian. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, that's perhaps a, a, a good one to, to mention. Can, can we say anything else about his reputation? Well, I think, the, time? I think the fact that he rose to fame through political and military office um, meant that he was he was known and reliable, known to be reliable. Um, and so there are, again, several parallels to um, to the to Vespasian in that regard, I suppose. Um, and it's it's an interesting one that, you know, with that many legions declaring for him and clearly he was there, he was their preferred candidate. Uh, and a really interesting that, of course, he and Claudius Albinus could could have reached an agreement, even though technically they were uh rivals and of course after 196 uh he has to fight Claudius Albinus um as as the candidate for the for the for the for the purple so what, what makes it definitive that they are rivals that's what I, I, I wonder because it sort of hindsight makes it <laughs> um I, yeah I think there's a rewriting of their agreement that when you look at there the is a rewriting one but I think to start with if you think about it then if you want to gain the, the backing of the legions in multiple areas and you have got a, a popular commander in Britannia, a popular commander in Pannonia, then the legions in those areas are going to look to those popular commanders and say, right, we expect you to step up and actually claim the, the position of emperor. And, wouldn't, you know, OK, then We've, we've said already that there seems to be some sort of pre-existing relationship between these two men. Um, if they are to start with working together, would it not have been sensible for them both to, in their own areas, knowing the pre-existing agreement or pre-existing situation, both for their for the Legion's publicity sake, say, yes, I'm stepping up to claim the empire, the imperial position. Which is what I think makes it look much more likely like it's a worked out beforehand, well beforehand, mm. because I think the, the sources tell us that there's rivalry. But again, the sources are all late. So mm. they know it's later rivalry. So they say, well, clearly there must have been rivalry. And yet Albinus uses Septimius in his name and calls himself Caesar without any problems of which which uh, perhaps is, is enough it may, might have been his his calculation that being able to call himself caesar is enough to make that point to his legions and uh, also the, you know, I, he, I, I, i'm now the successor yeah so and give he, me a very quickly mincy's coinage to actually set <laughs> advertise this point back in rome without and you're sort of saying well there's a, got to be a lot of time you know going back and forth to britannia in terms of messaging and yeah. communication but he's immediately getting on to on with the minting of coinage to say this is the situation. So, so normally, normally the the um, moment where the rivalry becomes uh, opposition is the naming of Caracalla and Gita as mm. as successors by Septimius. So that idea that it, you know, that breaks the agreement somehow, um, and I think because of that, and what what happens when when Septimius Severus and, and Clodius Albinus fight is the fact that well therefore there must have been rivalry early and I don't think that the, the, the way that they divide power so seamlessly and quickly uh, suggests it. I think they were I don't know. it seems well from what I've read that at the point where Septimius Severus appoints his sons as Caesar is just I mean Albinus could have not become an enemy to Severus, but it was clear probably by then that he was not the type to leave loose and loose ends. Um, hmm. Well, certainly it, his, his treatment of uh, the family after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, but, but he, you know, he, he'd split Syria up in two because it had, it was one of the few provinces still with three legions. So he just cuts it in, in, in half one province with one, one with two. Um, to not give too much power in the hands of, uh, of one senator and have another um, situation as with Niger. So yep. 
you know, probably albinus knew Septimia Severus, made a calculation and was like, well, there's very little I can do if mm. I just sit here uh, and, and you know, have to take, I mean, to, to point what, what Mark just said, I mean, if he first has to sell to his legions, look, I'm standing up, I'm claiming the power, and I'm now the successor, uh, yeah. and then have to be have to say, yeah, sorry, I just got demoted. I mean, how are they going to respond to that? Exactly. And I think the other thing is that the support for Claudius Albinus is vast. You know, when even though we think it might be a mistake, the fact that uh, Cassius Dio says that there's 300,000 men, 150,000 men on each side at the Battle of Lugdunum, um, that's what is that? That's three quarters of the men under arms in the Roman Empire. Yeah. Um, so we don't we don't agree with that. But even if you halve it and say, right, well, there's seventy five thousand men on each side, that's that's even Stephen's support for both candidates. So again, hindsight tells us that one was his rival, therefore defeated, um, and therefore rewrite the history of the relationship based on what the outcome in one nine six is. Um, and I don't think that that's that certain given the given the machinations of what they've gotten up to at that point i think you're right but it becomes obvious that they're going to become rivals and because of severus's decisive behavior he's you know uh, albinus's hand is forced yeah that does, does seem to be the case i'm not there's this story about um an ass assassination attempt on albinus i think that takes place after he's proclaimed himself emperor uh, of course, that could have been a, a convenient signal as well. Mm. Um, so I think, like, I mean, so yeah. going, getting back to the question, I think there's, there's so little um, anti-Punic uh, ideas about, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be anyone calling Severus a, a provincial or unworthy, you know, yes, he had to go to Rome like his relatives to, to make a career. Um, and so that was almost default made him universally accepted. Although it's a really interesting one that, you know, even under his empire, he does do a vast amount of campaigning in you know, not every province, but a, a fair few of them. Yeah. Um, to, to, I don't know, whether reassert his authority or, you know, the, the uh, you know, he adds to the Roman Empire, which is the first time that's happened in a while. Um, and is it Severus that the Roman Empire reaches its greatest extent? Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, from that regard, he's, he's very old fashioned in the fact that he is a conquering, successful yeah. military general. Um, so that model of the Roman Emperor um, you know, the Parthian campaign, he sacks Catissiphon, doesn't take Hatra. No one, no one's been able to take Hatra. So he's, he's, you know, the equal of previous emperors in that regard. He pushes the, the, the boundary in uh, Britain back to the Antonine Wall. So again, there's an aggressive uh, success there, invades Caledonia. But uh, I think what that tells you is that he, he is a military man. He's come up through the military system. That's what he knows to do um you know he gets glory from doing what the old people did i mean that 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 is the way things get done but he's imitating hadrian and trajan and it's not just yeah. in terms of the military you know where he's actually active but in terms of the titles that he takes they echo uh, you know deliberately what trajan and hadrian had already done and he's uh, maybe that's you know uh, part of the fact that he's not put, you know, pointed out as a provincial, he's yep. basically pointing out, reminding everybody, hey, this is what provincials have done in the past. I'm doing the exact same, so therefore yep. nobody can call me out on that. Yeah, but, and, and, and along those lines, I mean, it, there's absolutely everything to be gained by being traditional, mm. isn't it? The, yeah, the old yeah, yeah. values, virtus, and all that sort of yep. stuff. Yeah, they're, they're, they're yep. enduring. So he's just following in the footsteps of the greats before him and it does think, seem... but it's, it's very interesting that he campaigns everywhere you know that when you look at even under you know under marcus aurelius and lucius ferris after antoninus Pius, there's a there's a rebellion in in uh britannia um that gets put down not by the emperors but by one of their generals 
there's a rebellion elsewhere that gets put down uh, by generals rather than emperors. Obviously, Lucius Verus goes to the Parthian campaign and Marcus Aurelius goes north to the to the uh, Germanic campaigns. Yeah. Um, but there are other areas of unrest that are dealt with not by the Imperials, but by the appointees with Septimius Severus. He's the one who goes to the Danube campaign. He's the one who goes to the Syrian and the uh, Parthian campaign. He's the one who goes to North Africa. He's the one who goes to Britain. Um, yeah, and, and so, in that regard, I mean, the, 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 again, the precedence of people like Trajan and Hadrian and, and Augustus. I mean, this is what yeah, they do. I think, I, think I, I agree. I think it's very much that, but it's a it's a reassertion that hasn't happened uh, for ninety. You know, the last imperial campaign was Lucius Verus. Prior to that, it was Trajan's Parthian campaign. So the Parthian campaign thing's really interesting that you've got the only personally led campaign. You know, are Parthian. And then the one exception of the Macomani by by yeah. Marcus Aurelius, but Parthians are Trajan, Parthians are Lucius Verus, Parthians are Septimius Severus. Yeah. So there's a there's a continuity there, which is interesting. Um, but there's, and, well, let me throw there's barely anybody that he doesn't imitate. I mean, if you look at <laughs> he, he gives titles to his sons that Augustus gave to you know his grandsons and whatnot. You've got him trying to you know when he goes back and takes you know reasserts himself in Rome. He asks to be known as the brother of Commodus, who everybody yeah. hates, and yet yeah. he wants to link himself to. Yeah. He wants to link himself to every possible member of that imperial family and dynasty. But, but I wonder if it, it, this is all good politics in a sense, because he came from a situation where effectively the, 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 the Roman world was on the brink. I mean, there were these challenges. So it, 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 to defuse the situation by engaging the army in all these different theatres of war where he is, he turns their focus out, not in, so uh, that there's no possibility of a rival emerging when he's playing uh, the imperator, the, the commander. You, you mean <coughs> he's, he's, he's got the message, he's got the wolf by the ears, he better ride exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and I it's think... brilliant, actually. It's, in his conception, it's brilliant. It's very traditional. Very, yeah. Well, except in the fact that he's got Claudius Albinus looking after uh, things behind. Um, you know, he can go and do. Uh, Niger, he can take care of Niger because he's got an administrative Caesar that he's you know agreed to share power with. Yeah. Uh, so, so the the analog with that then would be Augustus, for example, and and Marcus Agrippa. So as a duality, as as, as a, a double act, I mean they're able to do great things together. Of course, uh, Augustus was very fortunate, and and in the other example, uh, things go wrong when I guess uh, that the guy shows he can't be trusted. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's a. There's so many parallels to earlier uh, periods and of, of unrest, and and you know, as as Mark was saying, the, the titles are traditional; they echo going back, you know, two centuries now uh, of behaviours, and uh, it's such an interesting yeah. use of not just recent uh, ideology, but ideology that spans the empire. Um, you know, or even back. when he comes in and you know takes a hard line against the senators and against uh, any any rebellious forces in Rome, mm -hmm. and decides to actually prescribe, he actually says that he's you know brings in the ghosts of Marius and Sulla uh, to actually justify his actions. That's you know, he is going back. He knows his stuff and how he's tying in the Republican era as well. But, but is it, I, I'm a little bit surprised that you think that. Why would he not? I mean, that that is that is the Roman way. I mean, this is this is how it has been done. They don't, they're not terribly maybe, inventive, maybe, are they? they? It's a strong contrast with Commodus. Yeah, it's not how Commodus did it. It's not how Marcus Aurelius did it. Um, well, Commodus hmm. ultimately was a failure. So no, no, no but it, that might be. Yeah, it might make extra sense to emphasize the tradition. Yeah, exactly. Um, but to, to, to sort of take this uh, as a as a segue. Um, Sam on Patreon says, how had the army of Severus changed since the days of Julio Claudians? So is the army still um, very conservative and does it work the same way? Or is this something we can't discuss in a single podcast? Oh, <laughs> that would be that would be unfortunate because they're all waiting for our answer. Um, I, I think my, my initial answer would be it was roughly the same size, wasn't it? Still around about thirty legions at that time. Um, found, so it's slightly found, more than the Judeo Claudians. He found Africa one, two, and three. So I think okay. we get up thirty-three legions. Okay. Yeah. 
So it's okay. it's not significantly bigger. I mean, it, it, it's it's roughly the same kind of number. Legions wise, no, because the auxilia we that's always funny. Everybody goes. There's about as many auxiliaries as there are legion, legionaries. This all goes back to um, uh, Tacitus' annals. Uh, was it four or five where he indicates something like that, and we just assume yeah. that this goes for two centuries afterward. Yeah, but uh, Cassius Dio though does does uh, uh, an inventory too, doesn't he? Right for right about this period, I, I think the, he. There's he a list of legions, but I don't think he ever. I I I don't know of anybody else who makes that sort of so many legions and so many auxiliaries, roughly. Yeah, I think that I think the comment in, in Cassius Dio is something along the lines: "There are so many, and nobody quite knows the number." It's something. Uh, yeah, yeah well, that, that like helps. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's no, even but, more auxiliaries, and we don't. Uh, yeah, lots yeah, of them. Yeah, but. But it One, also two, three, thinks that in, in a sense it psychologically says we know there's lots of them, but they're not that important that we actually. No, no, but I, I think there's a big difference. I mean, it, it it is a big difference to raise new legions. Yeah. But every emperor who wants to, who who needs to, can easily raise a couple of cohorts, an ally here and there to reinforce uh, a province where it's needed, and nobody's going to blink and oh, you're you're raising so many new legionaries. Legions. I think. I think. Septimius Severus is that this is the end of the image of the Roman legionary as we see them, uh, you know, in every popular media. So this is the the why why is there a, a sort of an anti Lorica segmentata kind of mentality these days? Do we not like saying Lorica segmentata? Um, I've seen a banded male come out much more commonly. Banded armor, rather than the the idea of Lorica segmentata. But anyway, um, I think this is exactly that. the same. Banded the armor and that, segmentata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is the end of that period. This is the end of that uh, period where that traditional Roman legion and Roman legionary look occurs. You know, we know that it, is it at Lugdunum or Issus where there's there's the testudo, but they're not sure if it's an actual testudo uh, that's used rather than a traditional testudo. But we find testudos being used in later periods of Roman warfare where they no longer have the rectangular, curved rectangular shields, um, which which is, you know, that it's not this just... Is the, yeah, it is, this is the era where equipment-wise things have started to change but haven't completely changed yet. Mm. I mean, well, can, still... Can I, can I just this, interject? Um, yeah. So, so Cassius Dio, book 55, chapter 24, 1, he goes on to say, he actually gives you a complete listing of where all the legions are. And, and the comment he basically makes about auxiliaries is that he doesn't know how many they were, um, but but the, but there is a record of it. So we actually do have two moments in there. We have the Tacitus, and we have Cassius. Um, but Dio. book book fifth, Cassius Dio, book fifty five has got to be still pretty early. Yeah, but he's but he's actually hit the. I'll read it out. Now that I have once been led to get into giving a count of the legion, I shall speak of the other legions also, which exists today. There you go. Uh, and tell of their enlistment by the emperor subsequent to Augustus. My purpose being that. If anyone desires to learn about them, the statement of all the facts of a single portion of my book may provide him with the easily the information. So he's talking about his own day. Okay. Which yeah. is and, and, and we know that Appian's really, uh, really forward, good. I think, had, a, had an extensive overview of everything, armies and fleets, and hmm. somehow it had to be that part that went missing. <sighs> yes. Is Dio running, what, 2.30? Yeah, yeah, something like that. So, so, yeah. so it's kind of roughly contemporary with with our people. Fifty years on, I suppose. But but I think the answer to the question is that I I think that the army of Septimius Severus and his sons was pretty recognisable to the people of the Julio Claudians. There would have been some maybe technical innovations. I mean, I think that the structure and the job titles would have been the same. Uh, the military doctrine would have been pretty much the same. Um, and that's about it. But it's, it's starting to change. There, there are more uh, soldiers who are now are possibly legionaries who have, um, you know, we, we the introduction of the lucky aria, perhaps. Um, we have legionaries with oval shields, probably. But it's it's still it's very much in flux. It's actually very hard to pin down when these things change. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's one of those interesting things that later writers. Uh, will assume that that what's in their army has always been in their army, um, and therefore, when they introduce a gloss to explain 
the inclusion of clibinari or, or cataphractal or whatever, that's when you go, oh, that must be a recent edition when this person wrote, which is another issue in itself. Um, so <laughs> I think the problem is that you can go back. Oh, look, look, the, the Lankiarius. The Lankiari have been around. There are terms of people being called Lankiari for a long time. But, you know, the, we then get them as a unit in the uh, fourth century um, in the Natitia. So it's it's that, well, they existed and they exist. Therefore, what's the... We're the the same, yeah. I, I would have to come down and say that the, the Septimian Roman army was still uh, very, you know, roughly an army that it would have been what you would have seen in the Julio-Claudian era and that the major change to the Roman army that uh, when we see it, in, it happened sometime uh, during and perhaps on account of the crisis of the third century when so many things uh, fell apart and that the, the late Roman army is the outgrowth of the, the chaos of the third century. But uh, Septimius Severus stood on the, the, the uh, other side of that. And I think I the other thing is also the going to play shoulders of giants. I was going to. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> to complicate things, the Constitutia Antoniniana, uh, which then makes those freeborn citizens then become Roman citizens. It, it sets the mm. distinction between the auxilia and the legions kind of becomes become artificial, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep. it's a bit past our 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 current discussion, but yeah, that that's yeah. Uh, that's the reason why I think I think auxiliary it's a units disappear in the end. Yeah, I think it's a process that's going forward. That idea that's not a you know two eleven for the constitutio, but uh, I think it's it's much more gradual than than a than a, a radical change in two eleven. I think that that's been creeping forward uh, under Septimius Severus anyway. It may even be a Severan idea, um, which comes back to that provincial thing. That comes back to that idea that he travels through virtually not every province, but he travels through a lot, a large number of them, and perhaps without it being sort of explicit that he's provincial and is in the provinces, and that we are we are as Roman and as traditional as Romans. That that kind of ideology is possibly there. Um, you know, I think there are other aspects of the Septimius Severus reign that that are uniting the Roman Empire in a way that that is really interesting. Even even from the you know the persecution of Christians perspective, a lot of the a lot of the material that's coming out in this period in time is North African based. You know, we've got several martyrs from North Africa and and even the idea that um, there's a there's a specific policy against the Christians by Septimius Severus as opposed to uh the continuation of trajan's policy um as outlined to pliny so tactically um sam wants to know did the romans still employ some version of the diplex archaeus who here's a gimme i would say no but then i would say that when you look at things like the arians contra alanos that's you know it's 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 a hard one to pin down a specific um tactical ideology of the roman army in the field that you know the uh, wheelers put out the the idea that there's much more adaptation and flexibility within the roman legions that they can behave like a phalanx or like a legion or like a smaller unit when required and the you know the use of the auxilia allows them to take advantage of their own fighting styles and different terrains um so I, I almost wonder whether specifying a particular type of fighting in roman legions of this period is actually false anyway that they they will fight a the way their general wants them to b in accordance with what experience has taught them as the best style for the for the terrain they're in and the army they're fighting against, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything to be said in terms of when you've got Septimius raising uh, his three new legions uh, for the Parthian campaigns, that they are being described as being raised specifically for this campaign, that it cannot, you know, in the literature, it can't be construed otherwise, that um, the 
these troops are being prepared for that campaign? Is that suggesting perhaps different preparation and tactics being out applied to the legions here? Uh, well, that, that, that does seem to be implied by what, what Cassius Dio says, because uh, they're quartered in Mesopotamia, and then I think the reason why he put them there is you've raised them to be an occupying force. Yeah, but the, they there is some indication that they may have been at Lugdunum in um, uh, early 197. Um, and so that they were you know, perhaps raised with that in mind or uh, with the Parthian campaign in mind, but just taken west and perhaps performed as normal legions anyway. But it is... Mm. It, Speaking of Lankiari, I, I think one of many of the theories about Lankiari come from the uh, fact that the tombstones of was it Second Parthian Legion in as the Apamea? Yeah, um, yeah that mentioned by Cassius. Yeah, yeah, but there's a whole the range of tombstones mm -hmm. uh, of I think of that legion in Apamea that survive, and on, on them uh, there's a couple of soldiers who are designated as Lankiari. Is that three four? Ancient Warfare 34, where those are mentioned. God, that's ridiculous. How do I know that? I have no uh, idea. Yeah, Ross um, Cohen's article. <laughs> oh, my God. Crazy. How's that in my head? Anyway, I think I think if I'm putting my speculative tin hat on, yes, they are raised with the idea of specific warfare in mind because there seems to be a, a – especially when it comes to the Parthian campaign, which, again, stretches all the way back to Alexander the Great and emulating Alexander, um, that, that – those kinds of tactics are the kinds of tactics you employ against Parthians slash Persians who are in the Roman mind the same foe, uh, even though tactically they may not be the same enemies or tactics that they face. Um, and, you know, that happens again and some people uh, abuse it as a, as a, um, just a, a ploy or as a... Uh, a piece of, of, of sort of frippery as opposed to a real tactical response. Um, but then again, like, you know, in previous Parthian campaigns, uh, the legions 5, 10, and 15, Apollinaris, Macedonica, and um, oh, 10, Fratensis, they are used in uh, Parthian campaigns, but they are also then taken back to Italy then they're taken on Parthian campaign and sent elsewhere. So almost that idea that they're they're a specialist legion raised for a particular kind of warfare very quickly gets sort of disabused. They're not they're not kept in that area. They are moved where that you know Parthian specific tactic wouldn't necessarily be useful. Mm. Um, so you know if they're at Lugdunum in, in one nine seven, they're a long way away from horse archers and the Parthian warfare. And of course, we, we can see in the careers of centurions that um, the knowledge of how to fight somebody could easily be spread between and among legions mm -hmm. because they go from one to the other and presumably take that along with them. Yep. The um, Scottish campaign falls a bit outside the scope of the rise of Septimius Severus because... <laughs> Late in the day, <laughs> it's, it's late, yeah, it's not and very thing. close, very he, close he was, to the fall. Yes. He was he was very well established by then, um, uh, but perhaps we can uh, address uh, Brian's question about the Antonine Wall, whether it was just a trade and immigration checkpoint rather than a defensive structure. Um, who would like to summarize all the Limes conferences in? Oh. In, in a minute or two, I'm, I'm going to say there's a there's an article in the uh, in the issue itself which talks about the uh, the limes, uh, especially different limes, yeah, different limes. But um, yes, there have been there have been every opinion ever uh, given about the uh, the idea of whether it's a hard border or a permeable border. Obviously, in this day and age, that's an incredibly relevant discussion, uh, especially in regards <laughs> to Brexit and. Uh, um, you know, the, the idea of a permeable border is a hard, as opposed to a hard border. Um, and the Antonine Wall especially, I suppose in a way it suits the idea of a permeable border better, a permeable border better than the Hadrian's Wall, which of course is this literal hard, wall, you know, stone thing. And yet we now, re some people regard that also as a permeable border. Um, 
And again, I think it's problematic because you've got this idea from the early fourth century with the with the field army that they are reactionary forces to if the if the border is penetrated they react rather than they stop at the border mm -hmm. um, and you know this idea of, of of zones of control rather than um, hard borders and things like that I think there's as all of these Lima's conferences show you can pretty much make any argument you like and and the particular interpretation goes ebbs and flows and like swings of pendulums just to mix my metaphors um but i wonder i think the key word that you said there the, the key word you said there was control right so so mm. the permeability is okay but you're controlling the flow in, in and out of so um that, that there's that one uh, way of looking at it i think the other thing is also you said that the hadrian's wall what, was, was, was stone but part of it was actually turf and, and I think it just comes to pra pragmatics, right? The trouble is it doesn't weather very well and you want the structure to be there. So, you know, and the other thing is also you've got in Britain at the time, is it three or four legions? They're the people building the war. It's a great way to use the manpower um, on, on the premise that if they're not doing something, they're probably going to try to do something that you would rather they didn't. Um, <laughs> so, so I just think there's that. And the other thing is also these things are, they, these are conceived in a moment in time. So Hadrian's Wall is conceived by Hadrian, presumably, in 122 kind of when he's actually visiting um and just i guess he has an idea i'm gonna what, what do we just build a wall that'd, that'd be great um and then the antonine is built by a successor who may have a, had a slightly different uh strategic reason for doing it and i don't think we know what that is the, the antonine well, wall strikes me as strong. being a, a great deal of work uh, and effort was required to erect that so just to have it be uh, essentially a customs enforcement barrier uh, that doesn't strike me as being the, what it really was. I, I, I think that what these walls managed to do is, is that it helped to cut down on raiding because anybody who was going to raid south of the Antonine Wall, or for that matter, south of the ha of Hadrian's Wall, would have had to, if it was an especially large uh, you know, movable material such as cattle, it would have had a terrible time trying to get it over one of these turf walls. And I, I think the idea that somehow the Roman legionaries were either going to be fighting on the wall and stopping anybody from coming over or, you know, not really doing much with it. I, I think that that's a false choice. I think that what the walls were meant to do is, is that to be a benefit to the legions as they operated to uh, enhance Roman security by reducing the amount of manpower that you might have needed in any one location, uh, right, reduce, but, but remember what, reduce the, rating, right. And, but, and just, and, and uh, but why was it, for example, the Antonine wall was a turf wall and presumably uh, it, at some point in time, perhaps the plan was to bring all of Britain, or at least more of it, under Roman uh, control. But that idea was abandoned. And then, you know, you know, you uh, uh, maybe Septimius uh, thought better of it, and then tried to reoccupy it uh, briefly until it was finally abandoned. So, I got, so I got two 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 comments there. That I think the first one would be that the wall, Hadrian's Wall, we start with that one. Hadrian's Wall was built by the legions, but manned by auxilia. So there was a point in time, 126, 120, when the legions are pulled back and the, and the auxiliary are put there. So in other words, the legions are, are deployed because they know how to build structures, infrastructure that will last a, a long time. That is almost abandoned when the Antonine Wall is moved forward, which I presume is also built by legionary manpower. And isn't there the gas frontier that goes all the way up mm -hmm. the, the east coast, mm -hmm. which presumably is an indication that there was an ambition to move the, the, the frontier forward. And clearly it didn't work. They had to pull back and then they even abandoned the Hadrian's Wall, which of course then you've got the right. argument as to when, whether when they go forward and extend to the to the Antonine Wall, there's the argument of at some point there is a rejuvenation of Hadrian's Wall and right. the improvement upon the, the yes. turf sections. Now the dating of that has always been a, a hot topic of argument as to is it when they actually go forward and uh, this is where I like the the term being used in terms of the control of zones in terms of you know is this just shoring up the zone in front of hadrian's wall and saying right you know the turf wall is is something less permanent less less uh, solid than hadrian's wall but it's it's one level down from hadrian's wall as such and if you think about it later on that even when they pull back from the antonine wall later on 
uh, right throughout until the, the late fourth century, you've got evidence of um, Roman forces patrolling up to and beyond the Antonine uh, defense works. And you've got, uh, I think it's a Mithraic shrine on Antonine wall continues to be in full functional use and maintenance right up to the end of the fourth century, indicating that that presence or you know regular uh, attendance of Roman forces. So and that could hence be part the of this. Zones. Yeah. That that could be part of this control argument because what they're doing is effectively they're using that as a forward position for gathering intelligence, mm -hmm. so that that can then be fed back to the command structure further down south, uh, and I, ultimately it fails because the wall is actually overrun. Hadrian's wall is actually overrun, mm -hmm. isn't it? I, I can't remember yeah, what it is. It is. Um, I think. I think the other the other thing that's interesting is I think it's the imposition of Romanitas. You know, the um, well, I did a, a really interesting research for the Ancient History magazine upon the Rudge Cup. Um, and there's also the Staffordshire Patera and several other fragments, which is that the idea of of a Roman structure, which the Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall and lots of other limes and and forts are on the border, is the presence of of Romanness in this region, uh, which is both a imposition on uh, external forces and a reassurance for internal Roman forces that 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 you know the romans are here if that's if that's the right idea or the army is present or you know there's there's lots of re reinforcements of that idea um in in the wall itself the way it's represented in art uh the fact that there seems to be these um what's the word uh, sort of tourist memorabilia of the wall and its forts uh mm. that, that are produced for people to take home to remind them that there's Roman legions sitting on the border in Britain when I'm back in Spain, which is where one of the fragments has been found. Another's got found in Amiens. Do you know, like, that's a bizarre place to be reassured of the presence of the Roman you know, army the, the, on the Hadrian's Wall. There's a profound irony because that Romanitas that you've discussed there is actually projected by professional non-Roman troops for the period, right? It's actually mm. auxiliary. Yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. They, they look like Romans, but they actually aren't. So it's a very fine, interesting surrogate. But I think it's, it's that thing, idea. Yeah, everyone wants to be Romans. Yeah. But then the other thing I was going to say, ironically, the SHA actually says, that we're looking at under uh, the Severus, the chapter uh, 18, uh, 2 I'm looking at here. He built a wall across the island from sea to sea and thus made the province secure. So that so it, in the interesting case of here of, of the writer of the SHA getting it wrong, that was the thing that sparked the uh, legend that Severus built the Hadrian mm. Wall before it was proved that Hadrian built the wall. Yeah, Severus. I think that's a great point to end on. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> uh, yes, as usual, we've ranged far and wide, and we haven't even gotten around to discussing the sad fate and uh, cruel interventions of several people named Happy. Um, <laughs> I would like to uh, thank everyone for um, listening and thanking the team um Murray, mark mark Lindsay, and angus of course am i forgetting somebody oh, you. Uh, i'm forgetting myself oh yes well um if you'd like to um support the show you can do so on patreon look under ancient warfare podcast and of course you can subscribe to the magazine at www.ancientwarfare.com and um we'll see you again or hear you again in about a month Bye.